All right, guys, welcome. Um, I'm going to get started. Um, I suppose people might trickle in and out, but that's fine. Um, this is not my first rodeo. I've given a lot of these talks before in the past. Uh, what's really interesting is that over the years, uh, my thinking evolves, and I change my opinion on a few things, usually from either feedback or you know the industry changing or whatever it might be uh, that influences these guidelines. But uh, today, I actually spent a bit of time to put this together for you guys and make it into an actual strategy. So um, let's get started. Well, first, I have to actually make sure this is selected. OK, there we go. All right, so hey, guys, I'm Gabriel. Uh, I'm a concept artist. I'm an art director. And I'm also the owner of my own company called the 101 Art School. So I live in Cape Town, South Africa, uh, which is pretty beautiful. You can see it down there at the bottom right. It kind of looks like concept art. It's just like super, super pretty. Um, that's my wife, Marilu, who is currently 20 weeks pregnant with our little boy. And when I'm not arting, I'm a major foodie and a lover of our two cats, Aslan and Alaska. Uh, they're siblings, right? Super cute. So uh, today, I hope to offer you guys my own insights into the industry. We'll cover the psychology first, the practical steps, and a foolproof strategy that you can use to get hired as soon as you're ready after that. Uh, but first, let me show you a little uh, of my own journey, just for some context. So where I got started. So my first job was out of college. Uh, it was super random. I was hired as a 2D artist for some of the first 3D iPhone games. Um, some would say that was like living the dream, but the truth is I was really making peanuts. So I was earning about $400 per month um, as a professional artist, which was... Yeah, not exactly tenable, but it's a start, right? It's definitely a start. So from there, um, I truly believe that if I could have escalated my career, I think you guys can too. So my first big break uh, that happened six years later was working in Europe, specifically Denmark. Um, I had my flight, all expenses paid. They put me up in a place, all that kind of stuff. And I was being paid about five, five thousand, well, five hundred, five thousand five hundred dollars per month, right? So hashtag, I paid the price. I learned the the hardships of what you guys are all going through right now. Um, so I kind of feel like I'm in the trenches with you at the same time, like maybe like a little generalissimo or something like that. So um, after that, I came back here, I got married, and I decided to try my hand at art directing. I was hired into the role of production designer on a feature film working for Triggerfish Animation Studios. And uh, that was about two years after that um, Denmark uh, sort of trip. And ever since then, I, was, uh, I started working on little shows for Disney and Netflix and stuff like that. Um, so I have an IMDb officially because SEAL Team was released at the end of last year. So if you haven't checked it out, go to Netflix, look up SEAL Team and go watch it and let me know what you think. Um, and then I, I guess by now, you know, since I have an IBM, uh, IMDb profile, I, I always like to joke like I can finally say I'm an artist, right? That I'm enough. So I think that's a little joke because we all kind of struggle to identify who we are. Like, are we an artist? Am I enough? You know, it's like this whole long journey that we all have. I think we all share that. So um, this particular talk today, um, if this sounds like you, I think you're in the right place. So you aspire to be a professional concept artist or illustrator, right? If you're a 3D artist, I can't help you. It's not my expertise. Even though I do know some 3D, I just can't help you with that. Um, and when you apply to art jobs, you might be getting rejected or ghosted. Um, and at some point, you've realized you need some serious skills to get into this industry. Um, this is not the right class for you if you have no desire to work as a professional artist, obviously, right? Um, you don't have any long-term vision or commitment towards this end goal for yourself. And you don't like personalized structure and accountability, which is pretty much everything we're going to be talking about today. So I wanted to put this quote up here because I read it yesterday and I thought it was absolutely brilliant. It's not the will to win that matters. Everybody has that. It's the will to prepare to win that matters. And this is by Paul Bear Bryant, a football coach. And that is so intensely true because I've noticed throughout my life that every single time I prepared to win or prepared to do something, the more I prepare for that thing, the more I kind of plan it out and create a strategy around it, the more likely it is that I'm going to actually execute on that idea. So before we begin, I would highly encourage you, if you haven't already, to turn off your phone, close all your other tabs, lock yourself in a dark room, whatever it takes to get you focused for the next little while. So today, we're going to be covering these topics together. So first, of course, is the psychology of going professional. And I think this is really, really important, and it's super underrated. After that, I'm going to show you three practical steps, steps to getting hired, right? One step in front of the other. Obviously, these steps are rather large, but they're very important. And if you do it in the right order, this order, um, I think you're going to see results. And then I've got some final thoughts at the end, which is just me ranting a little bit about some life stuff. So part one, the psychology of going pro. How to maximize your efficiency and reduce the time it takes to go pro. So let's talk a little bit about what's holding you guys back from going pro by talking about the time destroyers of commitment, starring addictive distractions, toxic relationships, weighing responsibilities, lack of leverage, lack of perspective, lack of self-belief, and lack of structure. 
So the first one is, are you addicted? Are you in denial about it? So addictive distractions look like phone time, video games, porn, food, entertainment, socializing, relationships, drugs, alcohol, partying, whatever you guys get your fix on that. And if you're addicted to it, like it's time to start facing up, right? So I don't want to just say these things to you guys, right? Because I believe that this is really important to know what these are that are getting in the way of you going pro, okay? But everybody suffers from a little bit of this, right? None of us are exempt from these things, right? We all have some of these to some extent in our life, some more than others. So what I'm really trying to say here is I want to offer you guys a solution for each one of these. And this is something I've thought about a lot, okay? So the solution for this one is to really just burn your ships to the ground, okay? What does that mean? That means that... If something is in your way, you need to remove it so that it forces you into a situation where you don't have it anymore, right? So for example, video games used to be um, a big thing for me, right? I, when I was like in my young teens and I was trying to learn art and I was trying to like get into this business, video games were a major problem because I was playing so much of them. So I see this all the time, by the way, it's not just one area of life. It can be many different areas, but for a lot of people, it is things like video games, phones, distractions, right? So there is no basic solution from this other than to just go cold turkey. Like it might not work for you, which is why I say above, you know, get some professional help if you can't do that, but do your best to just literally burn that ship, right? If you have a PlayStation in your house, throw it in the trash or like give it away to someone for a while and tell them not to give it back to you until like you've, you know, leveled up or something. Just like go hardcore with this. I haven't seen a way, especially for myself, where it's been something I can negotiate because addictions are just that, right? The moment you start negotiating, you just fall off the wagon again. So that's my solution. You may not like it, but uh, I'd, I'd implore you to try it out, okay? So let's move on. So are you in a toxic relationship? This is really important, right? Toxic relationships look like parents might be annoying you, your spouse might be breaking your balls, girlfriend, boyfriend, same thing, friends, same thing. Maybe even the workplace you're in might be toxic, okay? I want you to be thinking about this stuff because I can tell you from personal experience, even having been on the job, I've had situations in my life where something went bad, right? Maybe my mom was sick or a girlfriend was particularly um, you know, upset with me, whatever it might have been, and it destroyed my productivity. I was unable to work for sometimes a day, sometimes a week, sometimes a month, and it can really have an impact on your ability to output good art, right? And that's not even just in a professional setting. That could be like, hey, I'm studying in grandma's basement in order to get better at my craft so I can break in one day. And like, you have all this pressure from your family or something like that. You need to be looking at this stuff and asking yourself like, how can I get away from this, right? So here's a solution. Get some distance, right? Permanent or not, I want you guys to think about putting some distance between you and these people in your life. Um, I love the no contact rule. Like if you break up with someone and it's getting messy, just no contact rule, right? If someone is just constantly in your life, they're a constant narcissist or sociopath, no contact, right? It is brutal. The ghosting is real, right? But it's for a reason, right? You need to take care of yourself first. So turn off your phone, get a restraining order, whatever it takes to kind of get these toxic people out of your life. I think that's going to really, really help you. So next one is weighing responsibilities, right? So how will you work with your responsibilities? So for a lot of people, believe it or not, um, I don't just chat to aspiring artists who are like, you know, 18 up I, uh, to like, you know, 25, 26. I chat to people who have actual responsibilities who want to become professional artists. So kids, they have kids, they might have sick family members, they may be the breadwinner. Um, they may be, you know, uh, you know, they may be the one with a primary job in the house, or maybe they have to keep multiple jobs in order to keep things together. Like these kind of crazy frustrations, they happen to more people than you would think. Like, you know, sometimes you might just have a child out of wedlock or something, and you're having to look after this kid for like ever, obviously. And, you know, the father or the mother is not around, right? That has happened to me as well, right? I've had men mentees who have worked with me who have had these issues. So I have to raise it here and I just have to say that there is a way out, right? It's not easy. So um, you need to carve out some sacred time to level up and work on your art skills. So this is really hard, okay? This means making the sacrifice of getting up a little earlier or getting up a little bit after or, or staying a little later, uh, you know, after your work day. This time should be sacred because it's yours and it's actually ridiculously difficult to do, okay? It is not easy. I had to do this for myself when I was learning how to go pro. In order to learn the fundamentals on my own and put in the structure that it took for me to go pro, I had to get up earlier, right? I was waking up at like 4.30, 5 o'clock every day before work and putting in the time to learn my fundamentals in order to improve to the point where I could actually become a, a serious 2D artist. Um, so here's an important one, lack of leverage, right? So I want you guys to remember life become, comes before art, okay? We sometimes forget that as artists. Um, so 
if you're working at your craft and you have no money to do so or the time to do so and you're frustrated, that's a problem. Okay. So the, one of the first things I ask people is where's your leverage? Okay. And leverage looks like you have the money, meaning you can leverage that money towards in, investing in yourself, investing in your education, investing in learning new skills in order to level up and break in. And time looks like, well, everyone knows what time looks like, right? You need the time to work on your stuff. So if you're too busy with something, you need to find that time. Again, going back to crafting out, uh, you know, your sacred time to get all of this stuff done. And I actually say you need both of these. You need money and time in order to improve. A lot of people may just say you need time, but I'm, I'm not in that school at all. I used to be, but I'm totally not there anymore. So here's the solution. Uh, secure part-time work for yourself. Make sacred time to work and use your money to level up with high quality courses. I really believe this is the best way. Uh, don't work on your arts until you can literally afford to, okay? Because sometimes you may have the pressure of rent and all these other crazy, you know, life circumstances that get in the way. Uh, make sure you dust this and get it under control first and then go work on your art part-time. So lack of perspective, infatuation or having a hyperinflated ego around the quality of your art. Okay, so I'm asking here, where's your head at? So I want to start by humbling you guys a little bit, and this is not to scare you off, right? It's just stuff that I've seen and stuff that I believe. You're more than welcome to disagree with me, but let's jump into it, right? So I think around 5% of 2D artists go pro, and less than that have probably consistent, powerful careers. Yes, even the server right now with its hundreds of artists, not everybody will make it by a long shot. So you must ask yourself, what percentage of artists are even here, the ones that came to this talk, right? Now think how many of those are actually going to take action on everything I show you today in order to succeed? How many of them have actually got a strategy in the first place, right? How many of you here actually have a plan set into place, right? So yikes, right? This is scary stuff. This is like, oh my gosh, like that, that's a minority of artists. So uh, you will never compete with your peers. This is a very good note, right? You have to know this. You will only ever compare your work and ability to seasoned professionals. So I want you guys to learn to temper your desires and just put your head down time and time again until you get there. And this is something you're all quite familiar with. But again, this is something a lot of people don't realize. They keep looking at the work of like people, even in the server, posting their artwork up. You're not competing with those people. You're competing with professionals. And I'll explain this a little bit later on when we jump into the strategy on how to get hired. So you think you want to work for Riot Games as a splash artist, right? So 99.9% .9 of aspiring artists tell me this, okay? So I've interviewed artists, aspiring artists from all over the world uh, for my school in order to find out what the hell is going on in this, right? And that's a lot of what people tell me, right? So it's just like you started the gym and you said to me, okay, I'm going to go take gold for powerlifting at the Olympics. If you're serious, you guys need to be bloodthirsty. So my question to you is, are you hungry for this, right? Like, do you really want to do this for a living? Because you're going to have to work really, really hard and be dedicated. So not everyone has the commitment to become a high performer, but all high performers tend to work for the big boys. Now, this is not to say that you, you can't work in this industry. I'm just saying that if you want to work for someone like Riot Games or Blizzard or whatever these other companies may be, those are the high end artists of our industry. That's like the 10% of the ones of the 5% who make it in, right? So you have to be a little bit above average in that sense. So uh, here's the solution. I want you guys to never trust your own eyes. So I want you to show your work to professionals and get the most brutal feedback you can. So that is a massive lesson in humbleness, right? Just being able to like, take it in the face and being able to move forward from that. Um, and so if you want to be great, um, another tip here is to go work with the best people you can find and learn from them, right? Because I feel like I, that has always been the best way for me to learn, right? I always learned incredible skills by working with incredible people. And so I really just want to uh, in, emphasize that upon you. And if you can't find people around you who are great that you can just work with or work alongside or get in, uh, feedback on or be a mentee to, pay for it, right? Just put your money where your mouth is. If you want to be in this industry, just pay upfront, like get the best education you can. So uh, this is all the next part, right? This is about the lack of self-belief, right? So quality in, quality out. That is my mantra in life, period, right? So I'll only make great art, right? This is one of those things that, um, you know, no great artist has ever said because they know that to be great, you need to fail more than those who, have, who essentially give up or never try. Failure is deeply important, and so you guys need to start your failure collection as soon as possible and never stop. Just start collecting those failures one after another, right? But always try to do your best. So I encourage you guys to go watch my YouTube channel. There's a video on there called the 10x rule. It explains this quite clearly, um, and it really changed the way I saw how my art progress and how I saw failure, right, with my art. So here's another one. I'm an artist. My art is who I am. So this, I think, is a recipe for depression. 
Art is a job, it's a passion, it may be even a love, but it sure as hell isn't who you are. I want you guys to resolve to separate your sense of self-worth with what you're capable of in just one small area of your life, okay? Don't be an idiot sandwich. So, lack of structure. Are you lost on your journey? This is a big one. So why is structure so important? Um, and why do I keep mentioning it throughout this talk? Okay, so structure leads to discipline. Okay, so discipline comes from completing things. And that's going to get you results, right? Those results that you get are going to start opening doors. They're going to start bringing in opportunities to you. So I want you guys to almost screenshot this page, save it as your background, put it above your bed, put it on your bedroom, on your bathroom mirror, whatever it takes. Just remember, like the more structured you are, the more you are uh, putting something together to achieve something, the faster you're going to get what you want. So take your time, do your due diligence when selecting structure. Always take an active role in your skill acquisition, and I'm going to say your education as well. Uh, because no one will care about your path more than you, just period. Like, not even me, man. Like, when you work with me, I love you to bits. I do my best, but I can't show up for you 100%, right? That is your job. So signs you're lacking structure right now might be that you're learning randomly. So you're hopping around, pivoting before you acquire control and confidence in an area of art. You may be putting your portfolio before your skills. So in other words, a cart before the horse. You may be making art pieces randomly with low skill. In other words, you have crap fundamentals. And you're hoping to land jobs with that, right? That is the ultimate denial, right, of what's going on. Um, and you may also notice that you have a lot of downtime in your art production or you have a low art output, okay? So that may prove that you haven't got a plan, okay? You need to take action. Um, so if you haven't got a plan and you're not taking action, you're going to be in trouble, right? It's as simple as that. So the solution is get some help, right? Obviously, to all of this here, find a way out, right? Like go look for the people who can teach you. Go look for, for the ways to get out of this. Put a plan together for yourself or even apply the strategy I'm going to be teaching you today. But do as Michael Jordan says, get some help. So here's the last, uh, well, one of the last ones, I think. Lack of energy and enthusiasm. I call this our meta efficiency. And I'm going to take a little sip of water here because I've been talking. So this is where you just can't be bothered, right? We've all been here. We all suffer from this. I want to normalize that with you guys. You're not broken, right? We all suffer from this. But it's really important to kind of go into a self-inquiry around this. So surprise, guess what? You're human, right? Whoa. So here are the ABCDs here of negativity on the left, right? We've got depression. We have the ability, we have the, uh, the fact that we might be unfit, unhealthy. We may be eating like shit. We might be burnt out. We might just be lazy, right? And we may also have a fear of pain. So I resonate with all of these. I don't know about you guys, but at one point in my life or another, I've been in all of these, okay? So I've decided to just unlock this piece by piece with you guys. So depression, how do we like deal with that, okay? So depression, one of the cool things I heard was deep rest, right? Deep rest. This is something that works for a lot of people because we have mediocre depression. We don't have clinical depression, okay? If you have that, then you need to take a break. You need to just chill out. You need to have some deep rest. You might even need a holiday, a vacation, in my case, in my career, I actually took a break halfway through my career because I burnt out badly. And this caused me to be depressed. And so what I did is I got a completely different job. And that job actually like brought me back to life, right? And so I was able to go back in. And we'll talk about that under uh, burnout. It's a similar idea. Um, but if you're clinically depressed, like there's something seriously like mentally wrong with you in terms of, or imbalanced within you chemically, right? You need to start thinking about medication. And I'm not saying go crazy. I'm just saying like enough to get you to a working standard, right? Because I've worked with a lot of people who have some mental issues and it really holds them back. And I think that um, they're very good. Most people are quite good at, at dealing with that. But I do believe that if you're in a very desperate situation, you may need to consider medication. So, of course, you're going to have to talk to a doctor about that. Um, so, unfit and unhealthy. So, this is a crazy one because I think, I don't know, a lot of people suffer from this. And you may not even know that you're suffering from it because, like, we're all couch potatoes nowadays, right? So, you may not even know that this might be the thing that's holding you back energy-wise, right? So, just start small. Every day, I encourage you to do, like, a five-minute, ten-minute walk. And try and escalate that walk to about half an hour or 45 minutes because at that point, you're actually starting to burn uh, fat, right? And you're starting to put your body into a state of uh, basically catalyzing. Um, so that's very, very healthy. Try it out. If you're eating like shit, um, get help, change it, do whatever you can, just like make small incremental changes, right? To just boost your energy, right? This is all about lowering the things that take energy away from you and increasing the things that give you energy. So for example, I started small by cutting out carbs one meal a day, right? As an Italian, that's really hard, okay? Because we love our bread. We love our pasta. Okay, so that's what I did. And then I started escalating that. Now I only eat carbs about like, I don't know, two, three times a week, right? And that is a tremendous difference, right? But I didn't 
I didn't jump to the end, right? I took it piece by piece. So here we have burnout. Everybody experiences burnout. Please recognize it's normal. Everybody has gone through it one way or another. I only know like one or two artists who have never experienced burnout, but they're freaks, okay? Um, take a break, take a vacation, whatever it takes. Just get away and, and recharge, okay? It's really, really important. And recognize the signs. Try to recognize the signs before it gets bad. If you've experienced burnout before, you know the signs. Just don't let it happen the second or third time, right? Like actually step in front of that train and take a break. So um, if you're just straight up lazy, yep, you're human. Totally cool. Go be lazy. No problem, okay? If you have a fear of pain, this is an interesting point, okay? I actually believe pain is 100% necessary to growth. So I call it shedding your skin because a snake cannot grow. An animal cannot grow. A spider cannot grow, right? All these weird, creepy animals can't grow unless they shed their skin. And that's deeply painful, one might assume, or at least uncomfortable. And it's this uncomfortable nature and this, this place of pain that is really, really necessary when you're trying to learn to become a great artist because you will 100% feel pain, right? And everybody does. Don't think you're alone. Cool. Part two. Let's jump into the actual practical steps, the three steps to getting hired, okay? So this is the industry in 2022. Are you guys ready for this? All right. The industry looks like this. That castle essentially represents any kind of company that people may be wanting to work for. Okay. The soldiers that are besieging this place, that's all the artists who want to get into that company. Okay. So very, very good analogy here. Just very solid there. So at the bottom, I've described three types of people that approach this castle. Okay. You have the vast, vast, vast majority of people who I call the brute force people, right? The warriors, the people who storm the gates. And you can see an absolute ton of them over there at the front of the gate, right? Just trying to bludgeon their way through the front door and through the stone walls, right? Like that's going to ever work, right? So what's going to happen is like, they're not even going to notice you. They're just going to throw oil on you and it's going to be a horrifying experience okay so i list that as very very difficult to get into the industry it's really hard to storm the gates and bludgeon your way into this industry then you have the tunnelers okay before i talk about the tunnelers because that's what i want you guys to consider i want to talk about the industry pros okay so the industry pros those are the guys who are like chilling back here chatting about their strategy about you know the next job they're going to get they probably have a good salary at back at home like something's working for them they're chill, right? And then the other ones are just like like putting up ladders on the wall and just hopping over pretty easily, right? They may have like one or two struggles, but for the most part, they've got an in, right? They've got a network. They've got people helping them into the industry, right? Or they just have killer work that allows them to get jobs much, much faster than us, right? So where does that leave everybody else? Well, you can be someone who storms the gate or you can do what I prefer to imagine, which is the tunnelers, right? So where are the tunnelers right now? We don't see them, right? Because they're too busy digging, right? They're probably in the trenches here somewhere digging. Now, those guys will get into the castle, right? One way or another, they're going to end up in the sewer line. I don't care. They're going to get into that castle, right? But it's going to take some time and it's going to take some strategy, okay? Where they start digging may actually be, you know, the fastest way of getting in. It's going to definitely be faster than being murdered at the front wall of this place, right? So the strategy I'm going to explain today is for tunnelers. It's for guys like us, right? Like I want us to think differently about breaking into the industry. I want us to strategic, be strategic about it, right? And be sensible and do it properly. Okay, so step one is to get your fundamentals in order. You cannot skip this step. Don't try, you'll be in trouble, right? Because you're gonna hit walls, micro walls, all kinds of stuff like that, right? So why is fundamentals important? So fundamentals, ultimately, it's a translation of the word control. Fundamentals in your art allows you to have control in your art, meaning you can make high value art. In other words, you can make any image from either imagination or using a, boat, a boatload of reference, right? You can essentially make something and you can make it high value. We'll talk a little bit about that later on. But that's really important to actually getting hired, which is the final step, right? So this is the order. You get your fundamentals in order, which is also control, which is also skill. That allows you to make high value art and that high value art will hopefully get you hired, right? There's no other way. There's just no other way of circumventing the system, in my opinion. So here is a graph I built for my students, right? So this is a learned, uh, learning a, a structured fundamental program is like working basically in a time machine, right? So the number one biggest issue I see with aspiring artists who take the self-taught route, and by the way, I did that too, is they lack time horizon perspective. So in their mind, one year, if they said like, I'm going to get hired in one year, right? It typically takes an additional three years in reality. This is because of the structure and the mileage that they're lacking by not studying a structured fundamentals program. Okay, so I know it sounds like I'm pimping my own program in a way I am. And this is why I made this graph because I was showing my students what the hell happens to people when they don't do this stuff, right? So as you can see here, uh, the sharp incline, right, is to save you time. In my, in my course, I try to do it in one year. It might take a little longer or maybe a little shorter, but it's around this zone here, right? 
once you have your fundamentals dusted, now you can start working on a portfolio. And that portfolio is the thing that's going to give you a breakthrough to start getting those first jobs. Now, notice what happens here, right? There's a massive delay in learning the fundamentals. All along this line here, what we're not seeing is the struggle of the common artist, right? Someone who hits a wall with their anatomy, someone who has no idea how to work with color. I don't understand lighting. I don't understand how shadows work. I don't understand how reflections work. Like, I don't understand how to do hard surface. I really suck at 3D. Like, all of these things here, all the fundamentals that's going to get you to this point here. Right, to where you have your first breakthrough, which is I'm skilled. I'm a skilled artist. I can now work on my portfolio and have a high margin of success because the work I'm producing will land me those first jobs because it's high quality. Okay. So even if you take this road, by the way, this road down here, that was my road, right? It took me ages. It took me about six years, to be honest, um, to get to this point here. And I thought it would have taken me like two or three, right? So there again, time horizon perspective in young aspiring artists is really, really bad. So um, once I got in, it wasn't easy, right? I had a lot of bumps. So these bumps here, why do they exist? Because I didn't study my fundamentals with the right structure. Okay, so I just want to emphasize that with you guys here. So uh, your fundamentals need a specific logical structure to acquire the world-class skills you need to launch and sustain your career as a professional artist. So the order of the structure actually matters. So the first thing you study, the second thing you study, the thing after that study, et cetera, et cetera. Okay, so as a total freebie to you guys here today, I'm going to tell you the first one. Okay, the first one you need to be studying is perspective, right? If you have no idea what perspective is and you, ha you have no ability to control it, you will not succeed as an artist, right? It is a paramount importance, right? It is super, super important to making any kind of image or any kind of concept. So the next one is you need to be accountable to it, okay? So uh, you need to ask yourself, who is keeping me on track with the system? Is it yourself? Have you created your own system? Are you following my system? Who's keeping you accountable to that? So you need to have some accountability to the fact that you're deep studying, right? You need to go into like a deep study mode with this fundamentals journey. Then you need to be committed to it, okay? So that's um, what, essentially what's my ultimate reason uh, to do this and what are the consequences if I don't, right? So what are the consequences of me not studying the fundamentals? Well, let's go back a second, right? Boom, it's going to be years of frustration, right? Or perhaps here's the worst part. You work super, super long. You get over here, you get hyper frustrated. And you know what? Fuck this. I'm not going to work in this industry. And you just peace out, right? I've seen that too. It can destroy you, right? It's messed up. And the last one here is you must have a means to measure your progress and quality. Who can tell me that I'm making progress in my work and or if I'm spinning my wheels, right? This is also really important. Uh, when you're working on new artwork, when you're working on your skills, you need to be showing people and saying like, hey, how is this? Is my color working? Is my lighting working? Uh, is my perspective working? Does my anatomy look right? Uh, is my tank looking cool? Is it too detailed? Where is it going wrong? Please show me so that I can make it better. And you keep doing that until you get to a point where your work is of high quality. Okay, At that point, you know, okay, I'm ready. So step two is after all of that. This is about plugging your art holes. I personally believe in this because everybody has art holes. So did you know you could actually be one skill or one action away from being hired in your field? So that is true once you have your fundamentals, right? There might be something in your skill set that you still suck at that if you fixed may actually get you a job. And I see this a lot, right? So number one, I want you guys to identify your niche in art. So uh, you can change it afterwards, of course, but you can think of things like characters, hard surface, environments, animation. This is all about being a specialist in the field, right? It is much more likely that you're going to succeed and have a more luscious career and be known for your art if you focus in one of these areas, at least at first, right? I say you can change it afterwards because, of course, artists can, like, dabble, right? We can move in different directions. But it's really good to be known for something. Number two, I want you guys to identify the industry you want to serve with the particular skill sets you want, right? So, of course, I can say I'm a concept artist, but do I want to work in games? Do I want to work in live action? Do I want to animation, casinos, comics, right? These skills translate. Once you have the fundamentals of art under your belt, you can start making these decisions for yourself. So you may lean towards live action realism, or you may go, actually, I prefer doing visual development for animation, right? So that is super cool, but you need to kind of figure that out at this stage because you're going to start building a portfolio, right? And you want to target that portfolio. Number three, I want you guys to identify the top three key skills that you will need, right? In order to be a bad, like badass. So research like a madman, uh, go ask others uh, who they think is at the top of the industry that you're trying to apply into, right? Go look for the best artists who are doing characters in animation, if that's your thing. If you like paneling and comic books, go study Alan Moore, go study the guys who just absolutely dominated that scene, right? Who currently is producing, you know, the best game art out there who's working on the creatures for those games you know you can keep 
unraveling this for yourself. And you can also ask other artists who they think are the best. And generally speaking, you're going to arrive to a point where like everybody starts agreeing like, hey, by the way, Dave Raposa is the best at illustration, right? So once you know that, you're like, oh, I need to be checking out his work. I need to be like figuring out what he's doing that's making everybody like, like his stuff, right? And really decoding it. So here we go. I want you guys to start thinking about working from the worst skill to the least worst skill of yours, right? So I want you to take courses around this. I want you to make studies. I want you to read books. I want you to sacrifice a goat. I don't care, right? Just get good at those skills that you see these high-end artists performing. So it may even be something like anatomy, like maybe an, a, a character artist is particularly like savage at his anatomy, right? And you can look at that and you can say, well, my anatomy is good. Like I finished my fundamentals education, but in order to get it to his level, where am I, where am I missing this? Like, what do I need to be doing in order to get to that level, right? So the more time you spend getting your fundamentals in order and plugging your art holes, the easier step three will be, okay? So step three pretty much takes care of itself at that point. So step three is building a portfolio so good they can't refuse, right? So what does this entail, right? What makes a killer portfolio? Spoiler, it's not easy, but it can be done. And I'm gonna outline it for you guys here. So a good portfolio demonstrates high value number one. So that means that you're showing iterations, you're showing color options, you're showing clean thumbnails, not messy sketches. You're not showing things like studies, right? Obviously, um, you're showing great ideation, you're showing problem solving, and you're showing high skill in the fundamentals. Okay, so problem solving it exists even in illustration. If you guys want to move into illustration and not like say concept art or visual development, it still matters because someone's going to give you a brief, and how well you execute that brief is problem solving. All right. So here I've just got a couple of pictures showing that, like some of my favorite artists, like Stephen uh, Oakley, he's just an animal. Like he's got really, really cool breakdowns, uh, great options, some really cool design work. Um, and then here I just showed you this breakdown of an environment at the bottom right for a particular reason, which is look how much information it's showing, right? That's what I mean by problem solving. It's like, I could have drawn this thing as a facade, right? And how much information would the modelers have had? Like, I don't know, they could have made me, maybe made two buildings, right, without scale. But having an image like this solves a lot of problems because it shows scale. It shows the, the positioning of the buildings. It may even show like time of day. It may show material. It may indicate material at least, right? It may show the setting where it is. It may show like what's, wh what is where and in what order, right? And it shows like where things are and what they are, right? So huge amount of value in one image. And that's why those images down there are so prized, right? They're just super valuable to productions. So. The next thing is a good portfolio demonstrates consistency. So this is color, style range, subject matter, in other words, your niche, and a design sense in your work. Okay, so you can see here, this is a portfolio you may all recognize, um, but it is incredibly uh, consistent, right? You can see the color palettes are similar. Um, the subject matter is different, which is good, but it's all kind of landscapey. There's a few characters in there, but we're mostly interested in his ability to uh, execute on what we see, right? Which is quite clearly environments, props, and maybe if we need them for characters, we can bring them in on that, right? So moving on, we need to think about having a portfolio that, that demonstrates niche, okay? So what are you actually known for? Show that and be the best at it in your own way. So a lot of artists mistake this for style, okay? A lot of artists come to me and say like, how do I find my style? It's a very common question. And quite frankly, you may not like the answer. I personally think it's a bullshit question, right? Because style is something that comes about from having studied the fundamentals, having drawn a lot, having painted a lot, having been influenced by your, your heroes, having drawn in a particular industry for a period of time. Like all of these factors come together and define what your art looks like, okay? And it's inherently unique to everybody. And that's why we think it's style. It's someone's unique style. But if, for example, you try to mimic that style, all you're doing is becoming like a second grade version of that artist, right? I think a lot of people would agree with that. Um, so in the case here, you can see this artist here, incredible line art, incredible, just focus on characters, just like super high skill in this zone, right? So what are they gonna be hired for? Well, it's pretty obvious, right? And the last one here is it demonstrates appeal. Okay, so I call this the cool or the magic factor. So this is similar to niche, but it's not really tangible, but try get it anyway, okay? It's really, really hard to get this. So what we're looking at here is a bunch of Dave Raposo's work, okay? So Dave Raposo, if you don't know him, shame on you. Um, he's considered to be one of the best illustrators of our, our current generation, right? He um, did a lot of the kind of crazy strategy stuff that I've been sharing with you guys. He kind of instigated that whole school of thought, right? Which is lock yourself away, study really hard and come out like an animal, right? And that's what he did. He essentially locked himself away for a year or two 
uh, in a basement. He started an organization called the Crimson Daggers, which no longer exists, right? Where he brought in other artists to join him. They started like this micro cult basically, and they got extremely good at what they did. And for Dave, that was about, you know, getting high, high detail rendering, right? And very realistic uh, character anatomy and proportions and all that stuff. So he's done an incredible amount of work for him vast, vast variety of clients, right? He actually is a freelancer. He doesn't work for anybody, although he has worked for big companies. He freelances, right? So just to show you, like, you know, when you're at the top of your game, you know, this is, you know, people hire him for this. You can see that, right? It's his, it's his mad cool artwork. So by now you should have your skills down, right? That would be the smart thing to do. But before you guys go making great art, I want you to consider planning a fictional portfolio, right? So after you've got your fundamentals down, this is where you can map out a perfect presentation using other people's artwork and using it as a template for what you want to build and show, okay? So this is really, really cool. I did this, right? This has three major benefits that I want to list for you guys. Number one, it gives you something to aim for. With each piece, you're replacing the fiction with reality, right? You're taking something that is already cool and you're replacing it with something that you made that is hopefully as cool as that thing. Okay, this is only possible when you nail step one, right? When your fundamentals are really, really good. Number two, it gives you a bar of quality to match your artwork to. So the layout, the content, the consistency, the value offering, the niche, maybe the color palette, the way it flows on the page, all of that stuff subconsciously affects the way people feel when they look at your portfolio and it makes them want to click on it, click in it and, and basically browse around and have a really good time consuming your artwork and hopefully hire you, right? And the third thing it does for you is it can inspire you to think of really good structure for a series of projects that could fulfill the portfolio and illustrate your voice as an artist. So a lot of the time, um, especially um, people who work with me, I do tend to steer them towards project-based portfolios, and um, that's quite exciting. And if you look at like a fictional portfolio, it may start to evoke ideas of where you would want to take your own portfolio. That might not have happened because you simply didn't put pictures on a page and look at them, right? You're just sucking something out of your thumb, hoping it's going to be great. So the big question here, but why? Why go through all of this, right? Why actually make this thing? So this strategy got me three major breaks in my career, right? So hashtag winning. And those breaks were not trivial. Um, I'm pretty sure every time it happened to me, I doubled my income, I moved country, I was hired into a completely different like tier of the industry, um, like I got my name on movies, like crazy stuff, right? So that's all because I did this crazy strategy. I reverse engineered a portfolio that I thought for the time and what I was applying to would be perfect, right? And I did that and it took time, right? it took effort, but it had a huge impact. So that's it, guys. At that point, you want to now go make your portfolio pieces um, that have high value, just recapping here, okay? They're consistent. They're focused, they're on, based around a niche, and they have magical, cool, badass artwork in it, okay? Easier said than done, I know, but this is why you want to be studying the fundamentals. So here are, here's part three, right? These are my final thoughts. Uh, the path I just shared with you is not easy, but it's way easier than not having a plan, right? So if it doesn't get you hired, you likely missed something. I want you guys to get professional help to see where you're weak and go plug that art hole up, right? Now, even if you nail all of this perfectly, you still need to get your work in front of the right people, right? That's really important. I didn't want to leave that out here. So be sure to network and make friends in the industry, right? That's half the fun anyway, right? Honestly, this industry is so awesome because once you're in it, you just like meet the coolest people. I love it. Um, and the strategy is just that, right? It's just a strategy. So if you don't like it or you don't believe in it, do us both a favor, don't be lazy. I want you guys to go make your own plan of attack, okay? One that you think works for today's industry. So do your research, make a plan, and remember, no plan equals your planning to fail. So structure and commitment towards a definite purpose will always outshine the opposite, okay? So I want you guys to be part of the 5%. The fact that you're here today, you're already getting closer to that top 5%, right? So uh, you can't plan a portfolio around a job, by the way, that pops up. So maybe you see an art post come up like, hey, we need a prop designer or whatever. But you can have a portfolio so good that it shouldn't matter because people will hire you on your work anyway, right? So there will be like another job around the corner that you can apply to with what you've already put together. So it shouldn't matter too much. To make it easier on yourself, be so good they can't refuse. Okay, so here's one. All artists, yes, even that freak, and I know a few, uh, sucked majorly before they didn't. Okay, I want you guys to know that. So you don't just see it, you don't see it because they don't want you to see it. Okay, so every artist has a treasure trove of crap, every single one of them, myself included, everyone I know, it's so true. Okay, so you just need to ask them if you're curious to check it out, right? Because <laughs> like I've done that too, right? I've asked them, it's like, hey, show me your old work, damn it. 
And then I want you to realize like once you see how bad they were that you can do this too, right? Because if you're bad at art right now or you're not where you want to be, like you can look at that, those guys, the guys you look up to even, right? You can even look at their early stuff and go like, damn, like shit, they were bad. They were worse than me. And then you have a permission slip, right? So don't forget this. This is really important. Um, most artists are also deeply selfish without knowing it, right? This is something I've learned over the last three years from chatting to artists all over the world. So think about your employers and your future clients and make something for them, right? Don't think about making stuff just because it looks cool and do the best job in the world and uh, that you can on, on producing this kind of artwork for people, right? And that's really the secret to high value in a portfolio, right? High value in a portfolio will get you hired. So when you're thinking of the other person, the person who's looking at your work more than you care about you know, what you're producing for yourself, that's the secret, right? That's when you start becoming a, essentially a professional artist, someone working for someone else, right? And by the way, if you want to produce art for yourself, absolutely do that. Put it up on Instagram, but don't put it in like your portfolio page, right? So I encourage you guys to go and do something good for someone else with absolutely no desire for anything else to be reciprocated, okay? This is just pure life advice. This is something that has been so, so powerful in recent years for me. Uh, because life has a way of returning riches to those who help others, okay? This is, yes, you can do this. You can teach someone something in art, right? You can help them. You can take them under your wing. You can feed someone for a day. You can high-five someone at work. You can smile at someone. You can say hello, okay? Even within the context of networking, buying people beers, coffees, you know, whatever it might be, just be fucking awesome to people around you, okay? Because this always comes back. I don't know what it is. It's like magic. It's crazy. I can't believe it took me so long to figure this out. It's like cheating, honestly. So it's not, and I want you to do this from an authentic place, okay? Obviously, I'm not coming at this from a narcissistic place, right? This is pure love. Just go give some love to people. Like, it doesn't matter who it is. It could be your mom tonight. I don't care. Just like phone someone, right? And tell them you care and, and show up, right? It has a huge impact. Okay, so before I say goodbye to you guys, I do want to say that if you guys want to level like crazy, if you want to fix your bad habits, and if you want to create a killer portfolio together with me, I want you to visit my website. So go to 101artschool.com uh, where you can apply for a four-week trial membership in our comprehensive fundamentals program. So down here, I've just put out some student work uh, for you guys to take a look at. So if this is the kind of stuff that you want to be producing, some kind of high-end work that's going to get you closer, right, to that portfolio building stage of your um, your developmental, um, you know, uh, strategy, right, um, you want to be producing high-end work. And in order to do that, you need to understand how to be doing all this kind of crazy cool stuff, right? So that's it for me, guys. Um, that's the end here. You can have a cute kitten. And um, I would want to ask you guys, uh, what questions do you have? Wish I could give like a round of applause here on the uh, over the Discord chat. That was that was a lot of info very very quickly. Uh, yeah, I'm 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 hoping you record it so you guys can just watch it over and over again. And yes, kind of definitely there will yeah. be a recording. So while people have a chance to kind of process for a second and uh, yeah, type out yeah. some questions and whatnot, I have a few for you. Uh, just Epic. was taking some notes here. Um, Actually, two kind of primary ones, and then there were two things that you mentioned that I just wanted to point out for a sec, because uh, those kind of clicked with me, and I wanted to, to get a little mm -hmm. more in-depth on them. So uh, I guess we'll just go in order. Right towards the beginning, you talked about addictive distractions uh, and kind of removing yeah. like means of escape, right? I wanted yeah. to hear your thoughts on having like a vent, though, because one thing for me when I was doing the self-taught, like, I'm going to break into the industry thing, that's essentially what I did. I said, okay, where is my time going? I literally installed like rescue time on my browser and then watched like how much time I actually spent on games and stuff. And then I just removed yeah. the ability to play those, which what I found <laughs> was that it worked for a while. But what I ended up yeah. actually uh, happening was that I stagnated and I am still not 100% sure if it's just pure burnout or if it was uh, like just a lack of new incoming information, right? But I wanted to hear yeah. your thoughts on where that kind of balance lies. And I'm sure it's going to be different for every okay. person. But basically, what are your thoughts on having a vent? Because everybody does have to have time to chill, right? To, to like recuperate. Yeah. You can't just be all yeah. grind all the time. Yeah. You're going to burn out, right? Yeah, absolutely. So for me, I think those are two different things. Um, number one, you have uh, something you can relax into. Like maybe it's Netflix and chill at the end of the day. Like I do that with my wife, like almost every day of the week, right? Um, where we just like peace out and watch something and just kind of unwind because our days have just been intense, right? So um, that's completely healthy, I would say, to a certain degree. Like we, we try to limit ourselves. We say like one episode, two episodes, and then we just go to bed. We don't like binge like 10 episodes, right? Because it's, for us, it's like gross. We just feel gross in our bodies when we do that. So 
that might be something you can look at, right? If you're not disciplined there again. But um, the other to speak to the other part there, um, what actually happens with the addiction stuff is you have to understand it's not the thing itself. It's actually the dopamine release in your brain, right? So when we're consuming these products, we have a massive hit of dopamine in our brain. Like video games are extremely good at this. Porn is extremely good at this, right? For the right people, um, where it basically just floods your brain. And the more you consume, the more you want to consume, right? There's that trigger point that just says like, I want more honey, I want more honey, right? This is our natural brain saying like, there's, there, I can get stung a few times, but God damn it, I want some more honey, right? And so the sugar craving, that stuff just triggers this massive release of dopamine in your brain. And what happens when you do that on a consistent and constant basis is that your brain gets used to that level of dopamine. So I talk about this on my YouTube channel. I have a, a, a dopamine um, video that you guys can go watch it, all about this. But where, what happens essentially is at that level where your brain gets used to it, it becomes harder to come off it, like an addiction, right? And so it's not a physical addiction, like say heroin or whatever, like opioid, right? But it's more like a, a, a mental chemical addiction. And so what happens is you have to kind of back away from it, accept that it's going to be a draw to go back in, but also recognize that when you have that dopamine tap turned off, what happens is your brain goes into a depression. And so with that, your body shuts down. And so it goes like, dude, I don't want to do not only this, but anything, right? So you just kind of sit there and go like, I might have brain fog, right? If you, if you guys don't believe me on this, like check, check how crazy it is when you come off something, right? It is insane. Like, for example, video games specifically, what happens when you come off video games is that the space that video games was occupying in your brain doesn't go away because you stop playing the game. So for example, you'll be in the shower the next morning and you'll be like, man, I wonder what I could have done on level 32 of World of Warcraft. Like I could have jumped that one dragon or whatever it might've been, right? You start mulling over those thoughts because your brain is still like, I need it, I need it, I need it, right? That's the crazy, crazy thing. But as time goes by, that voice becomes less and less and less. And so it's honestly, it's crazy when you recognize what happens, right? And, and, and in, in the sense of uh, chemical addiction, like I uh, came off coffee at the beginning of this year, end of last year, for example, and I had a massive crash and I thought, okay, I've got these splitting headaches. It's horrible. I don't know what to do. Let me just wait three days and see how it goes, right? And after three days, the headaches went away and I was like, cool, I'm free of coffee. Now I'm just going to take a chill, right? And be caffeine free for a while. And to this day, right, I'm pretty caffeine free. And what is crazy about that is... Even after all of that passed, I had about two or three weeks of like the caffeine withdrawal depression. So I didn't know this happened. I had to look it up and I was like, oh, okay, I have brain fog. I have, uh, you know, less, uh, I don't know what, I have a lackluster desire to do anything, right? Like I, I feel lethargic. I feel sleepy. I feel like not communicating. I feel angsty. I want to be lash out of people, you know, this is all a response, an internal bodily response to coming off of these addictions, right? So cut yourself some slack. I would say just be really careful about it. Just be like, okay, cool. Let me wean, wean, wean. Or just in my, in my personal preference, just cut it all out and just be like, I'm going cold turkey. For me, that's because I don't like the idea that if I have Steam installed on my computer, I can just run back to Steam and install the game and play it, right? That is too easy, right? That's like me getting in my car and my drug dealers around the corner, right? It's, I don't even need to get in my car. I can just run to them and get it, right? I don't want that. What I want to do is put as much distance between me and the addiction as humanly possible by saying, I'm going to go live in Saudi Arabia, where like, if I consume this product, they'll cut my head off, right? I actually know people like that. And so like, it's an extreme way of doing it, but it freaking works. Like they got clean, right? So I do the same with my addictions. I just cut them out and I say, no, 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 no. Especially when I know that what I want to do with my life is work on something bigger, like say a new portfolio or my skills for like a period of time. I'll say like, you know what? I love video games. I'll play them when I feel ready again, but for the next year, I'm not going to do it. Yeah. And I'm just going to go super hard at this. That makes total sense. Uh, cool. looks like we have some other questions here, so we'll just go in order. Uh, Kidder asks, uh, question, is it okay to focus on creating our own niche, not based on someone else, but just something we like in our own art? Um, I would need some context for that. Um, something in your own art. It, with the thing with niches, it, niches have kind of been figured out already, right? They already exist. So uh, a niche, it, there are just niches within the industry, and then you could niche yourself even within that space. Maybe that's what you mean. So for example, 
um, say you want to become a vehicle artist because you really think vehicle niche is cool. So you go and work super hard at producing the coolest, most in-depth breakdowns of vehicles, the inside, the outside, who rides them, what the themes are, all that stuff. And you present it amazingly, right? But then you have your actual talent, which is you know how to render like an animal. So you make these things look badass, like really, 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 really good. And so you're not only a designer, like a crazy designer, but you can also render like an animal. So that then becomes your personal niche, the thing that people go to you for. It's like, hey, we could have hired any vehicle artist to design something, but we want finished, polished designs that we can show the 3D guys and the surfacing artists because the value train on that is so much higher. Does that make sense? Yeah, and I think it's important to uh, Kidder to clarify when we're talking about a niche in this context, it's more of like a niche that you are offering to the industry. So um, it's important to separate like niche from, for instance, style or or, or um, like pre Desire. presentation. I guess would be a better word for it, right? So a niche might be like uh, I've seen some crazy niches. I've seen like I design exclusively like medieval jewelry right like like that would be an example of like a crazy niche but basically yeah. that's yeah. kind of the context for for that you know in the context of this type thing absolutely absolutely and one more thing i want to add to that is um go take a look at um the japanese philosophy of ikigai where you have all of these elements of your life kind of combining and in the center is where you want to be because that's where you can basically be paid for what you love all these kind of things this is important because like you could pick a niche that the industry has no desire for. I could be like, hey, I want to do like hairstyles for like 80s action cartoons. Well, who the hell's making that now, right? No one. And so who's going to hire you on that? No one, right? So yeah. you may be extremely good at it, but it's not pertinent. So just be careful to balance what you love with what the industry is looking for, right? That's quite important. Cool. Uh, Nay asks a uh, question. If I have my niche, but my niche might not be an actual style that appears in a game or movie, so they might not want me, but I think my niche can show what I do best, should I do what I can do best or follow the meta? <laughs> Great question. It looks. It um, sounds like it's a big, very similar kind of a vibe, yeah. Yeah. The biggest question you need to ask around whenever someone says style, I'm worried about my style, the first thing you need to, to inquire, and it may suck, but it may be the truth, is... Are you talking about style or are you talking about how good you are at doing that thing? Because like, if you're extremely good at doing something, no one will care what your style is, right? They'll just be like, dude, you're an animal, like we want to hire you. So when you're worried about style, it's a weird one for me because people will hire you on your style as well. They'll just be like, can you do the job? Can you do it to a high degree? Great, we don't care what style you are. Like, unless we want you to like, I don't know, work on The Simpsons, you know, where something is mm -hmm. extremely defined. But even at that level, you've probably worked your skills and your fundamentals to a point where you could easily adapt, right? If you can't adapt your style, by the way, that's a pretty good indication that you haven't been working in the industry long enough, especially as a concept artist. Like as concept artists, we're not purists. We can't just like draw it the way we want the whole time. Sometimes we're asked to do things outside of our comfort zone on specific projects, right? So you have to be comfortable with being a bit of a shapeshifter. Personally, I love that kind of stuff. If you're super hung up on style specifically to have a style that is very unique, I would urge you to start thinking about moving into visual development for animation because in animation, style is prized. I don't know why it is, but it's just been it's just the way it's always been. And like when I was working in animation, painting skill and style were actually really sought after. And to the point where like if you use any 3D or you start drawing in a in like a generic way, people kind of look down on you a little. It's kind of weird. So um, yeah, think about that as well. Yeah, and to add on to that, and then we're we got questions piling up, so I'll have to go a little faster. But to to quickly tack on to that, okay. uh, I like to think of it as like if there's a invisible celestial bar of value, right? Like there's lots of different ways to add value to your portfolio, and there's going to be a threshold where the balance shifts into like, okay, let's hire this person, right? So you could add value through having the exact niche that the, the, the person looking at your portfolio needs, or you could add value by just having extremely high value, just objectively, like artistically high value pieces in your portfolio. You can also add value through like, uh, like Gabriel was talking about, um, you know, connections, like the industry pros where it's like, oh, I know this guy, like he's perfect. You got to talk to him, right? So like, there's lots of different ways to add value to, por to your portfolio, and I think each artist will add those in slightly different proportions, I guess. But I yeah. would consider it kind of like a niche is another way to add value. Because in theory, right, let's say you didn't really have a niche, but every piece in your portfolio was like 
the absolute best thing they've ever seen, like you're still going to get hired yeah. even without that. So exactly, um, it's it's so relative because here's the crazy thing is that your skill will always be the thing you get hired on. It, no matter what happens to the value, what you do, because like you just be such, okay, here's a great example. There is a few artists in this world who can do anything, right? And they're kind of animals, like seriously scary, scary people. One of them is an artist you guys need to look up called Paul Lassane. Okay, Paul Lassane worked on Lord of the Rings. He worked on all these other shows. He works on like all the big movies. He doesn't have a portfolio online. You know why? Because he's so good, he doesn't need to. That's the insane part about this guy, right? And so if you look up his work and you look at what he's capable of, he can do anything. And it's it's terrifying, right? I know another artist personally who's like this. His name's Dan Clark. Look him up on Instagram and just have your jaw drop because he's, he's insane. He's so crazy. He had like his work up in Times Square like a month ago. Like he's just absolutely crazy. And the thing is, like I was saying earlier, all of these artists have terrible work. They all came from trash. I had I was working at Triggerfish and Dan came up to me because we hired him as a freelancer. And he stood over me and I was painting a scene for SEAL Team for SEAL Island. And it was a huge landscape thing. And he said, hey, man, um, landscapes are hard, huh? And I'm like, yeah, they, they, they can be. And he's like, yeah, when I first started, I was absolutely terrible at them. I'm like, no way, man. Come on, you? And he's like, yeah, no, no. Like, I couldn't do them at all. Like, I had no idea what I was doing. And so just keep that in mind. It's, it's, it's crazy. Uh, right on. Nano Chan asks, uh, hi, sir, I have many paintings to grind tomorrow for art school. Uh, is there anything I can do to somehow gain the energy to work on them? I also have ADHD, <laughs> so it can get hard to focus for several paintings. Every time I'm forced to do a painting I don't want to do, I fall asleep. Yeah, man, that's that's a real issue because here's the crazy thing is um, when you're working in the industry um, and you like they put you in a chair, right, and they say, we want you to work on this brief, and by the end of the day, we want to see progress. You don't have an excuse. There's there's nothing you can do to stop that process. Because if you want to get paid, if you want to stay there, you have to produce. So there's a kind of pressure there that maybe you're not feeling that is just the reality of the job, right? Where we get paid to produce artwork that isn't necessarily for us. It's not necessarily something we enjoy. This is the part of the industry, like earlier on in the talk, I don't know if you guys remember when I was talking about infatuation as being a part of one of the things that psychologically can hold you back. I mean that like I talk to artists all the time who say like I really want to do this and I'm like but do you really like do you really understand how hard this is and like how um, how it's not always for you right you're producing art for other people so there's an element there that I would say for yourself you need to dig a little deeper and go like where am I with this how am I feeling about it and is there a way you can change your mental state can you say like the assignments I'm doing for someone else can I somehow imagine that it's not for them that it's for me Right, going to that level of depth with producing your artwork for other people is actually one of the sweet spots, right? Because then you take what you're doing, you do the absolute best job you can at it, right? If you're not feeling energetically there, go back in this talk, hopefully with the recording, and watch the whole energy thing, right? The uh, the meta of efficiency, right? Go through that list and figure out where you are on that list and start pulling the strings and finding out, like, am I burnt out? Am I this? Am I that? And start healing yourself psychologically so that you can get back into the work. I, I would add on to one other thing. I know that uh, the book The War of Art talks about this, but it's that concept of like resistance, right? When you're sitting down, especially when it's something that you don't already have a clear idea of, it's very hard to get started. So I can say one thing that generally works for me, if I'm really like, I have to get this out, I have a deadline at the end of the day, and I just absolutely do not want to, um, I generally try to set myself the goal of grinding out a page of bad thumbnails. I specifically try to make them bad. Um, and then what that does is a couple things that gets your brain kind of spinning on the problem. It like forces your brain to think about it in a very oblique way. And then you have something on the page. So then once you've got that page of bad thumbnails, you've been sitting and drawing for 20 minutes or whatever. So you're already kind of in the artistic mode and then you can take a look and say, okay, which is the least bad and how can I make it better? And that's like kind of an easy way to slide into like getting into that kind of like think about the problem type mode. I don't know if that'll help yeah. because it, it really depends on what's causing that, but just something to consider. Yeah. I, I do want to add one more thing, which is um, I think I've, I've, I myself have some level of ADHD, I'm pretty sure, right? Like I really struggle to concentrate on things for long periods of time, but, um, and, and I know other people who have the same issue, like really great artists have the same issue and they tell me the same, which is so crazy to me. Um, but what's really interesting is that we all figured out a way to not only do it anyway, but do it in a way that's really fast 
right? Like if you have very low attention, that means that you just need to be faster, right? Like I know a storyboard artist, for example, he's an animal at, at, at being a storyboard artist and he works so quickly. He does like a frame in like, I don't know, 10 minutes, like a whole detailed frame. He's a very good draftsman. Why did he get, move into that profession? Well, it suits his personality, right? It suits the way he works. So think about that as well. Like maybe you're geared to move in a faster way, like start manipulating the way you work, like and feeling into it and seeing where you are. Uh, Benjils asks, uh, do you think it's worthwhile to put your portfolio together and apply to studios or is it better to st just keep making work and putting yourself out there until your work is undeniable and the jobs start coming to you? Uh, like through uh, contests, events, is, or online presence? Yeah. Dude, that's such a great question. Um, so a while ago, about a year or two ago, I actually thought that the best way to get into the industry was to be so undeniably good that um, that things come to you. So what I want to do here, let me actually, um, is there a way for me to show this? I wonder, no, I don't think so. But um, so what happened, I call this um, a career portfolio. I call this, um, I call this, um, what is it? Um, like personal, is, I actually call it the branding career. Okay, so this can happen, but it's most likely going to happen later in your career. So don't stop applying to jobs. You're gonna need food. You're gonna have to get food on the table, right? God damn, like go work as a professional artist. If this is what you're doing, go do the thing, right? But as you're doing this, keep producing great work, keep doing the competition work, keep posting to Instagram, keep your social life, all these things, and, and produce that personal work. Because that personal work, what it does is it starts to build out a personal brand. There is one artist I have to put you on, right? Go to Instagram and look up this artist. His name is Rocket Boy Art. Okay, he's a friend of mine, Malcolm Walk, right? I actually interviewed him on my YouTube uh, channel. He is an incredible character artist and he's an absolute savage at animation, right? He moved into that discipline, but he never did it professionally. He was always a concept artist professionally. But because he kept his passion alive, he got jobs from everywhere because people came to him because they saw his branding, in other words, what he was putting out there, right? And they came to know him for that thing. But this is something you need to establish over a long period of time. It doesn't just come overnight. And I would encourage you to use social to leverage that. Use Instagram to leverage that. You won't be able to do this, say, for example, on ArtStation. It's rare. Like, rather use a platform where you can show your work out to as many people as possible and have that work hopefully be super appealing, that they want to share it, other people take a look at it. So yeah, you can get huge opportunities from this. I actually think that's like the final tier as a, as a lead artist in a particular field is to do a brand career. To tag onto that a little bit as well, one thing that I've found a massive amount of my contra or my like freelance work actually comes from posting in crypto centric Discord channels. Uh, Discord, I think it, you can you can almost consider like a social media, um, but like yeah. a social media that's full of people in a specific niche. Which means if you find a niche where there aren't a lot of artists, you get kind of the big fish in a small pond type effect. And especially if it's a niche where you know that art is needed, most of those guys don't know where to find artists. So if you're just around yeah. and posting your stuff, it's kind of a shoe in for people to DM you and be like, hey, like, I have a project that needs an artist, like you're around. So that's like, for me, that worked really well, especially when I was first trying to get some more like um, work, essentially, right? Uh, especially like yeah. freelance, you can do crypto discords are great and game dev discords are great because uh, almost always like indie developers just do not have any way to get art. Uh, caveats are that, you know, they don't, they're not always used to working with artists. Sometimes the pay is not great, but you at least it's a way that you can kind of start to filter that out. Or if you're looking for some easy kind of experience working with clients, if you're newer, uh, that's something that's my pro tip to add on to that. <laughs> Yeah, I mean, that, that same avenue really works for just about any kind of social media where you can put yourself out there or, or network with people. Because this is, this is now digital networking, right, what we're talking about. And so I would just say, I would encourage you to, to look at just about anywhere where people are looking for particular skills of, subs, of, of, um, of artists, because you might not always just find a job on a job board. You may actually start your first round of jobs or even a freelance situation by reaching out to people just randomly and just go like, hey, you're working on this IP. I think I can do it better than this guy or I think I can do a good job for you. Like, check, check out my work. What do you think? Like, even in real life, do that, right? Uh, here's a question. Uh, I want to do art commissions one day. When will I know when I'm good enough to do commissions? Um, that's such a... For whom, right? Okay, so there's a difference, right? There's art, art commissions for, like, the Pope, 
right? And then there's art commissions for like Sam, who's your next door neighbor or your mom's friend, right? Like there's differences, right? So I would say if it's a low end person who's asking you for a commission, just do it, right? Just if you want to get into commissions and you start, want to start producing artwork and start checking out how good your skills are, there is no better way than actually just doing it. And I have an illustrator friend of mine. Um, he actually looks up to me as a kind of mentor. He's a bit younger than me, and he, he's. I've watched his illustration journey from, from going from like the bottom to like I think he's he's going very very high end pro at the moment. Um, and what he did was he just like reached like like we were saying he did digital networking. He 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 spoke to the right people who were looking for the right skills, and he just kind of kept wedging himself in there and kept doing commissions for fans. Like he did World of Warcraft commissions. He did a whole bunch of commissions for people. And were they great at the beginning? No, they weren't. But over time, he was able to spot how good he was because he did that thing I was talking about where you show professionals your work and ask them, like, hey, where can I improve? And he would do that with me. He'd send me a painting and be like, hey, where am I sucking at this? And I'd be like, dude, your background is super conflicting with the contrast of your character or, like, the shadows are fucked up or your anatomy needs work or whatever. And credit to him, he would go and fix those things. And so he would level up his skills and start producing better commissions for people. Where has that led? Well, he got a full-time position working on a card game, right? Now he's working on this thing exclusively. He's the only artist working on this IP. And from here, I think he's going to work for the big brands like Magic the Gathering, all that stuff, because he's ready. He's actually at that point now. He can be doing that. That makes total sense. Uh, right on. A couple other questions, and then we'll probably wrap it up since we're starting to run a little long. Uh, bonus question. No Could you share the greatest or your favorite source or inspiration or artist that leveled up your design skills? Wow, um, I'd have to think about that one. Wow, um, I can, um, I can. I would say uh, Joe Mad was the biggest one for me. Uh, he's a comic book artist. Um, he produced a comic book series, if you're not familiar, called Battle Chasers. You may be familiar with the RPG that was made recently in the last, like, whatever, five years or something like that. Um, up on, I think you can get it on Steam. Uh, it's called Battle Chasers or something. It's, it's sort of like a JRPG. Um, but the comic book series was the thing that got me into art. Um, I was in San Francisco at the time, and uh, I picked it up at a, at a bookshop when bookshops were still around, um, at least out there. And um, I picked it up, and I just thought the cover looked cool, the back, the art in the back looked cool. It was all sealed up, so I just bought it. And I took it home, and I opened it up, and lo and behold, the art inside the comic book was almost better than the art on the covers, which is totally unheard of. And I thought, this is insane. And the whole thing was fantasy, right? Which is also hasn't been done since, really, in a meaningful way in comic books. Um, and he was combining Eastern appeal of manga and anime at that time with the Western comic books, like layouts and design sense and all that stuff. And so please go take a look at Battle Chasers. It is such a game changer for me. I still have my copy. It is like the, the covers are almost coming off because I've looked at it so much. It is the thing that I always turn to when I don't know what to do on a stylized project. I always look at Battle Chasers, and I'm always like, okay, what did these guys do? Like, how did they stylize? Like, what makes it so appealing? And I start reverse engineering a lot of that stuff. So you may even, once you start looking at that stuff, see its influence in other people too. Um, and I, by the way, I was never a great stylized artist. Um, I actually worked with a guy who I ended up interviewing on my YouTube channel, Luke Fillion. Um, so I worked with Luke for many years. Um, take a look at his art as well. Um, he influenced me massively. Uh, especially towards being stylized, because if you're not a stylized artist, if you don't know how to stylize or how to push design, um, work with someone who does. That's that's my tip, right? And I worked with this guy, and he would always just be better than me. So I always just pushed and pushed and pushed till I got to that point. Yeah, that makes total sense. Um, one other one in the chat here. Uh, how can mm -hmm. you overcome or improve a slow art process, especially for commissions? I plan and gather references fairly quickly, but grinding past the first sketch seems to take way too much time, several weeks, comma, months, for the level of content I'm producing. Yeah, that, there's no problem with that. The reason that's happening to you is because you haven't got the confidence, right? And that can happen in two ways. Number one, your fundamentals suck. Number two, could also be that you just don't have enough experience, right? So even when you have great fundamentals, producing a painting may take you a week, right? When I got started, I gave myself the permission slip to produce great art in the space of two weeks, one piece of art for my portfolio. And after six months, I had a portfolio. So that was one of the plans I put together for myself, which is why I say you need to strategize, right? You need to think about how you're attacking this thing. Don't be put off by the amount of time something takes you when you're learning, number one, and number two, when you're starting out, okay? Time put in shouldn't mean anything to you. What you're looking for is quality. Chase quality, don't chase 
time. I've heard this from multiple professionals who all agree. I mean, Feng Zhu, like he's a massive proponent of this and he's one of my heroes. So yeah, I take, I, that's what I believe. Yeah, that makes sense. Uh, that's all the questions. I wanted to do just one tack on to something you mentioned because I think it is important yeah. and then we'll go ahead and wrap it up. Uh, in the step three of uh, steps to get hired where you're talking about the portfolio, you talked about the kind of quality or the objective quality of the pieces, things like you know iterations, color options, ideation, problem solving, stuff like that. This was yep. something that was not immediately apparent to me and I felt really dumb when I learned it afterwards, so I wanted to throw it out there. It is totally reasonable to rework stuff specifically for your portfolio. Like, especially if it's stuff that you've done professionally where you were on like a tight deadline or something like that, there, mm -hmm. it's not cheating to go back in and brush it up or to like go back in and do that render pass you wanted to do or whatever, like yep. for the portfolio. Cause your portfolio yep. is like the thing that people are taking, seeing like at a glance. I used to, I don't know where I got this idea, but like I used to have this idea that like, oh, if I don't present it exactly as it was on the day like then it doesn't count that's just not yeah. true yeah. like like yeah. you can I, totally I go back I, and rework stuff yeah i i want to add to this and uh, i think what we're talking about here is is a is one of the deadly sins that i i see all the time even in my own mentees when they come work with me for the first time and i'll give an example of what i'm talking about just now but it, what i call it i call it um being an art purist and what that means is you're trying to, you think that there is some way that if you, if there is some specific way that if you produce art, you are an artist. You're not. Okay. It doesn't matter. It's like bringing a knife to a gunfight, right? It's so crazy in today's industry that if you rock up being like, Hey, I'm a purist. I painted every detail on this thing. And it's like, why, why the hell did you do that? You're wasting time. Like, we don't want to hire you, you idiot. Like, you know, it's like, you could have just had the 3d guys like. Put a texture on it right so that's a classic example of just like being a purist for no reason and so you need to be investigating that for yourself as an artist like i understand if you want to go make like this crazy detailed painting or whatever but like does it matter how you got there like if it all looks the same like objectively right like i don't think someone's i mean i i, I know like especially in animation there are so many art purists it's ridiculous but i come from video games right we're not that pure um, and, and film neither. Film is the worst. Film is like, we don't give a fuck like how you got to a specific situation. Like, did you use like, like, did you clip something out of a photo and then like put 3D on it and then like dress it up in the evening with a spotlight and then put yourself in the photo and then like brought a real tank in and then had the makeup team make a mask for you? Great. It looks perfect. It works for the frame. Put it in the movie, right? Like send it to, to the visual development guys. So like the purism kind of increases the more you move into animation i think and maybe some of those fields close to animation but even within those places like be careful because you might be wasting time um, a classic example of this in my own school is in the early fundamentals when i start giving out shape exercises and drawing exercises with line what i often see is that people want to draw perfect circles and perfect ellipses by by hand and i'm like i hear you that's great First of all, here are a bunch of techniques that you can use to speed that up and make it so much easier for yourself rather than being a perfect artist. Because here's, a, here's the truth at the end of the day. It's gonna take you like how long to be a great line artist from a dexterity point of view. It's gonna take you like six months to a year to really get tight line art, right, with dexterity. That is so much time. Like you could have made like the thing three times, duplicated it five times and had your shape, right? You could have drawn a straight line holding shift why didn't you do that? Why? It's like, oh, because I think that if I draw from my hand, if I do hand drawing, everything's like much better. Why is it better? Like, it does it look better? It looks okay. It doesn't. If it looks better and it takes you the same amount of time, I would say fine. That's that's great. But like, there's a there's a psychology here behind sometimes the madness of what we do that isn't in check. And I the crazy thing to me is I don't know where it comes from. Does it come from high school? I don't know. Like we got somewhere along the line. I used to be this way too. And I was chatting to someone in the Philippines yesterday, a young artist who said the same thing. He was just like, yeah, like why, why do I have to draw th this way? And I'm like, no, you don't have to. Like there are no rules, bro. <laughs> like do whatever you can to get the results. Like this is the craziness of our time. Do you think Leonardo da Vinci or Michelangelo wouldn't have used a better technique to paint like the Sistine Chapel or, you know, the Mona Lisa? Of course they would have. They would have just been like, oh, this is innovative. Let's use it. Right. They're they're pioneers. Right. That's what they do. Yep. That that sort of kind of like cutthroat approach was something that took way longer than it should have for me to kind of get the hang of. But uh, yeah, I mean, it, you obviously do want to be careful of like copyright. You can't just steal other people's art. 
but um, outside of that, like, it, man, if if it looks good at the end, that's really what the client cares about. Like, almost no client will care about how it was achieved. Yeah, exactly. No, here's the crazy thing: the people you work for aren't artists. Yeah. Right. The director, he isn't an artist. Like your art director might be, the lead might be, but ultimately, when it gets to the director, he's not looking at it through the lens of art. He's looking at it through the lens of design and function for his film. Yep. So when all of our art in studio goes to the meetings in the morning, the director will look over all the art, check them off based on what he feels, right? He's like, oh man, it looks super cool. And I know you spent the whole day on that, but uh, it's not going to work in the film. Just get rid of it. So yep. it's it's brutal, right? That's how it is. Yep. Well, I think that's about the amount of time that we have. Um, so for anybody cool, interested, guys. there's going to be in the resources channel down below. I'm going to go ahead and link uh, Gabrielle's art school. Uh, the link to that, and then also the YouTube channel. So that'll be there, yeah, uh, so you guys can check it out. Uh, and then as usual, the recording for this will go into the AWH Sessions chat as well down below. So Awesome. I, I just want to uh, say one last thing, which is um, thank you to Grant, obviously, for organizing this. Um, I think it's really important you guys get the best information possible. Um, I don't know if I'm the best to, to do that. I, I, I would say I'm quite um, pedantic about these details, but... Um, yeah, I just want to say thank you to AWH um, Discord for bringing me in for this. And I do want to say to you guys, thank you for attending because it shows your seriousness and that speaks volumes, right? I want you guys to realize, like, I'm looking at a screen right now. I don't know how many of you are in here, but it looks to me like there's probably, like, just over 12 people, 15 people right now, including Grant and myself. You guys are the top tier of people who care. Okay, you showed up because you care. That already puts you in an advantage. So no matter what's going on in your life, no matter how hard your art gets, just know that you, the way you show up right now is going to take you to the place where you go pro.